Hey, Capital City Church, it's Pastor Rick, and I just wanna tell you, Happy Easter. There are a couple things I wanna point out to you. First of all, we are here on location at Iowa State University at Riemann Gardens, and uh, we're going to be here because we'll be investigating the question, what do you think about Jesus? Or more specifically, who do you think Jesus is? What better place to come than one of the locations that's known all throughout the state of Iowa and most of the Midwest for teaching people how to think. Before we do that, I'll be teaching a short section where we will begin with the good news of the resurrection from Jesus Christ. After, and we'll be back here on the campus of Iowa State University at Raymond Gardens, and I'm gonna be talking to you about a very important question. Who is it that you think Jesus is? Did you know some thought he was Lord? Some people thought he was a liar, and some people thought that he'd lost his mind. We're gonna get into it right now. He has risen indeed. That's the reason that we're here today, is to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am so thankful that you're here. And, um, you know, I was just thinking about you all week as I was preparing this message and uh, praying for you. And, and I was even thinking about you when I was driving my wife around this week um, as she was um, uh, picking up stuff, food and toilet paper and toothpaste, you know, just shopping stuff. And my job usually, uh, if I'm lucky, is just to go from parking lot to parking lot and just sit there in the parking lot and wait for her to come out. Sometimes I have to go in, it just depends. Um, this last week I was fortunate and I didn't have to go in, but I was being a really good boy. And so I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna get Starbucks for us in just a minute. And um, she said, well, why are you telling me now? And I said, well, I know sometimes you need a little bit of warning because you don't always know exactly what you want. And I was being real careful because you don't wanna offend. It's just the reality that sometimes she needs a little extra time and I hate to wait there at the drive through window. You're just staring there talking. And, and so um, I even gave her a second warning. We were getting closer to the time when I was gonna drive to Starbucks and I'm like, hey, sweetheart, just want you to know in just a minute, we're gonna go drive through Starbucks. And she kind of looked at me again, like, why are you telling me that? So we got up to the drive through window and I ordered mine, super simple, grande, pike place with a couple ice cubes because I'm not patient enough to wait for it to cool down. And I look over at Joy and I'm like, what would you like? and she's reading the menu and she's taking her time. Now I will wait for her for an hour. She is the person I'll wait forever for. I mean, I would rather shop with her. I mean, than anybody else I can think of on the face of the earth. So I'm not really complaining, but I did give her a lot of warning. So finally the lady on the other end of the, the speaker, she's like, uh, would you like anything else? And I'm like, just a second, my wife, she's reading the menu. And when she's done reading the menu, this is the part that got me. And it's beautiful, but it's also a little confusing. She ordered the exact same thing she orders every single time. And so I thought we probably could have made this a lot easier, but yet there was a process. So I asked the question, what took so long? And, and she was like, well, I might've wanted something else. She said, I just decided I was gonna get what I had last time. But the might have gotten something else was what intrigued her, is what interested her. And regardless of whether or not you think you came today, and you're gonna get the same thing that you've always received when you come to church on Easter, I'm praying that you may order something else or more specifically that God may have ordered something else for you today, a surprise, something you didn't expect, something perhaps new on the menu. We left off on Good Friday with Jesus being crucified. Before that, we know that Jesus was um, betrayed, that he was in the garden and he was praying and he was praying that God the Father would not uh, make him go through or not, to, uh, he would like withdraw uh, the command or the request for Jesus to go through with the crucifixion. And, and of course, he said, your will is more important than mine. And he asked his disciples who were there, would you just pray for me? Would you stand watch? And they fell asleep. And so he went back and he said, why are you guys sleeping? Can't you even stay awake long enough to get my back here for a few minutes in one of the worst times in my life? And then he, he went back and prayed some more and he prayed to God the Father. And he said, God, your will is more important than mine. And he went back and the disciples were sleeping again. And then the third time, the same thing happened. And he said, guys, you have to wake up because my time has come. They're coming to arrest me. And sure enough, Judas leading a band of thugs with pastors and deacons included, Pharisees and Sadducees, were coming into the garden. Judas walked up and gave Jesus a kiss, which was the sign. They tried to arrest Jesus, and Simon Peter whips out his concealed sword, takes a swipe at Malchus's head, misses his head, but hits his ear, cuts his ear clean off. And Jesus looked at Peter and goes, hey, whoever lives by the sword dies by the sword, picks up the ear, 
puts it right back on Malchus's head, and they still arrest him. Now, wouldn't that have been a clue for you and me? Chances are, this is a guy we don't want to mess with, right? I mean, you don't want, but they still arrested him. So they took him to the home of the high priest. And the high priest questioned him and said, are you the king of the Jews? And he didn't say a word, nothing. Didn't have to answer him. Why won't you answer me? No answer. So the high priest was angry, took him to Pilate's house. Pilate, questioning Jesus, he said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you say that I am. Pilate's wife came out and whispered in Pilate's ear and said, listen, I've had a dream. I've been troubled all night. Don't mess with this guy. He's innocent. So Pilate, a little freaked out. Yeah, you know, they're kind of um, a little superstitious, in this case, rightly so. He said, I'm going to wash my hands of this. I want nothing to do with it. He offered to give the Jews any criminal they wanted back. It was a a practice in their celebration. They could have any criminal. Uh, They had a murderer named Barabbas, and surely he thought they would take Barabbas, but they wouldn't take Barabbas. They they, they wanted Barabbas to be freed, and they wanted Jesus to be crucified. And so Pilate said, I'm not going to crucify him, but he did have him flogged, 39 lashes. Let him go and said, Jews, do with him what you want. So Roman centurions, some guards begin to torture Jesus. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They gave him a staff. They took his clothes off and covered him with a a mock robe of a king, continued to hit him in the head, making fun of him, ultimately giving him a 165-pound cross and making him carry it at least part of the way up a half-mile road or route to the hill where he would be crucified. As he was crucified, people hurled insults at him. Aren't you the king of the Jews? You, if you were God, should be able to do something about this. Call down on your angels. Call Elijah. And as Jesus hung there, the Bible tells us from noon until three o'clock, it became totally pitch dark in the middle of the day. At three o'clock, Jesus uttered some words. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, an earthquake happened. The first of two earthquakes you'll hear about. The veil in the temple was torn in two, separating the holy of holies from the rest of people like us, representing the fact that we would have access to God. The Bible says that some of the dead who had believed rose to life, began walking through the city. It must have been really, really crazy. The guards who were standing there, petrified, finally got it. And they're like, this guy must be somebody really important. He probably is God. They believed the disciples scattered. And a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea said, can I please have Jesus' body to bury him? And so Pilate, surprised that Jesus was dead already, gave him the body, and Joseph took Jesus and buried him in a tomb that had been freshly cut out of a hill. The Jews were suspicious, thinking that the disciples would try to steal the body and continue the legend of Jesus being rising from the dead and being God and all the things they were afraid of. So Pilate said, look, guard him as best you can. So they took soldiers and they put them around the tomb and they sealed the rock in front of the tomb and three days went by. And as the three days went by, the people who loved Jesus and followed Jesus were devastated. Satan himself thought he had won. The earth held its breath. Could it be true? Is it too good to be true? Could Jesus really be who he said that he was? On the third day, some ladies who had followed Jesus to try to attend to his needs had watched where he was buried, had seen where he was laid. They came to put some uh, herbs and some incense, some balm on his body to preserve his body. It was the custom of the day. And we pick up the story on the third day as these ladies were coming to minister to the body of Jesus. Now we know that another earthquake has happened. The ladies don't yet know. And as the earthquake happened, angels from the Lord appeared, one rolled the stone away. And after he rolled the stone away, the angel sat on top of the stone, 
which I think was an exclamation point to the best job ever. If you're an angel, what better job could you have than being sent from God to roll the stone away to prove the resurrection that happened? So he sits up there on the stone. I don't know what his pose was, but I bet it was cool. (laughs) Worshiping. And the ladies show up. Let's read this together. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they'd prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes, the angels, that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, I gave you more detail than you're seeing in Luke, but each of the gospels contribute more to the story, forming a complete picture. And I would encourage you to do what I did last night, and that is to go read the story from each of the gospels and the account that each of the authors gave that contribute more detail and different aspects to this story and allow it to sink in and to settle. It's at the end, the last section of each of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Now, the answer was, because we expected him to be dead. We saw him killed. We saw his body placed in the tomb. We saw the stone pushed in place. We saw the seal that the Roman government put on the tomb. We saw the soldiers under threat of their lives post up to protect the integrity of the tomb. That's why we look for the dead where the dead are supposed to be. And that's why they didn't expect him to be alive. He's not here, the angel said. He has risen. And the women said, he has risen indeed. Now, they, did, they didn't do that back then. That was just us that do that. They said, he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered into the sinners to be crucified and on the third day to be raised or raised again. Then they remembered his words. Perhaps it's true. Maybe Jesus is who he says he is. Who do you think Jesus is? And more specifically, who is Jesus to you? The most important question that could be asked or answered. And you may have come to Easter Sunday morning church expecting to order the exact same thing. Today, God might have something entirely different on the menu. And you may be surprised in the best possible way. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father, peace with God, reconciliation with God, relationship with God, except through me. And the way to the Father was through the cross. through the tomb, and through the resurrection, where sin, Satan, and death was defeated once and for all. And as Jesus, a few weeks later, ascended into heaven and took his seat at God's right hand, completed the work necessary for salvation so that you and I, because of God's love and his gift of Jesus, wouldn't perish, but could have eternal life. No one ever met Jesus and walked away, apathetic or bored. They had strong reactions. They loved him. They hated him. Or they feared him. He was either crazy, lost his mind. Or he was a liar and couldn't be trusted. Or he was Lord. The Messiah, the Savior of souls the forgiver of sin. Who is it you believe Jesus is? So here we are, as promised, back at 
the Iowa State University in the thriving metropolis of Ames, Iowa, particularly or specifically at Raymond Garden. And we're going to be investigating the question, who is it that you think Jesus is? Because that in fact is the million dollar question. In the book of John, we're told that God so loved the world, John chapter three, verse 16, he so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in him won't perish, but have eternal life. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. The flip side of that is anyone who wants to come to the Father to have a right relationship with God, to have peace with God, would come, could come, should come, is welcome to come through Jesus Christ. So what is it that you think about Jesus? In 1860, Rabbi John Duncan came up with something that he called the trilemma. Some people, you see, thought that Jesus was absolutely crazy and was really just unhinged, that he had lost his mind. The things that he said seemed so far-fetched, so hard to understand and to believe that um, it was just impossible to think a sane person could say these things. Some thought that he was just a liar, that he was a deceiver, that he was just trying to manipulate and coerce and control people. And some people thought he was Lord. Now, this trilemma, according to John Duncan, uh, could be handled very, very easily, that if you didn't believe that Jesus was just an absolute lunatic, that he'd lost his mind, if you didn't believe that he was a liar, then you had to accept him as Lord because his claims were too polarizing. Jesus said things in the book of John like, I and the Father are one. And when Abraham existed, I was there, boggled people's minds. But he also gave us some commands in the Sermon on the Mount that are really hard for you and I to live by. He said that if we have hatred in our heart towards somebody, that it in many ways is the same as murder. That if we look at somebody who's not our spouse with uh, an attitude or spirit of lust, that in some ways it's the same as committing adultery. He says that where our money is, our heart follows. And we can tell the condition of our heart by what we do with our finances. He said some things that are hard for people sometimes to to wrap their minds around and sometimes he does well it's a little hard to believe so some thought he might be crazy some thought he may be a liar and um, you know some thought that maybe he really was who he said he was now I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he came and lived a literal life here, a physical life for 33 years, 100% man and 100% God, that he never sinned and never made a mistake, that he was perfect, that he voluntarily gave up his life on the cross to take on my sin and your sin, so that when he rose again three days later, the day we're celebrating today, Easter Sunday, um, we don't have to perish as John 3.16 tells us, but we can have eternal life with our heavenly father in heaven. But what is it you believe? More specifically, who is it that you believe that Jesus is? In Mark chapter two, if you can remember last week, I know it was a long time ago, I talked to you about some events in Jesus' life. He had begun to gather a crowd. He'd left Nazareth where his life was being threatened by people who were tired of listening to the things that he had to say, these religious leaders who wanted him dead. And he had moved back to Capernaum, which was going to be his new home base. In Capernaum, he stopped by a home, probably Peter's home, one of his apostles or soon to be apostles, and uh, he began to teach. Now, remember last week, we talked about how four friends broke through the crowd, the crowd that was dangerous, the crowd that was distracted, and went up to the roof and tore a hole in the roof and lowered their paralyzed friend down to Jesus' feet. We talked about how Jesus looked at their faith, that he looked at the man laid at his feet and he said, son or friend, your sins are forgiven. And then he healed him. But it made the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of religious law, absolutely furious with Jesus because they said, who are you to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And of course, Jesus probably gave a little smile because that in fact was the point. And Jesus answered them and said, what's harder to heal a man or to forgive a man of his sins? He healed the man to show that he was God. And the crowd, many of them were drawn toward him and then some repelled further away. You see, when you read the New Testament, you never see anyone encounter Jesus and walk away with a neutral or apathetic kind of a response. They were either, I mean, just in love, loved this man and wanted to hear more and wanted to follow him. They were afraid of him because of the things he said sort of disrupted their life and he was calling them to things that were uncomfortable and more, or they hated him and wanted him dead. 
a little later in Mark chapter two, we see Jesus calling a soon to be disciple who was a tax collector, who was a Jew that had turned his back on, on the Jewish people and was working as a thug, a collector for the Roman government, probably extorting fishermen and, and set up a tax collecting booth there in the middle of the market. And Jesus was walking by with some people who would soon be his disciples. And he looked at Matthew at Levi and he said, hey, I want you to follow me. Now, not only was that scandalous, not only was that so counter to the culture, it was mind boggling, but the people who were watching thought this certainly couldn't be God because God would never associate with a thug, with a collector, with a person who'd sold out their people and turned their back on the Jewish faith. But not only did Jesus uh, embrace Matthew and offer him a different life, Matthew invited a bunch of his friends to his home. The Bible says that it was full of sinners. Now, don't be judgmental about this because you and I are sinners. Many of us have been saved by God's grace and through our faith, but sinners just like Matthew's friends. And the Bible says that Jesus didn't just stop by and have prayer, but that he actually went in and had dinner with them and hung out with them, which was scandalous to the religious leaders of the day. Them thinking Jesus was up to something, that he was either lying about who he was and had some sort of an angle, that he had lost his mind and didn't know what he was doing. But yet there were a few that were holding out hope that he was Lord. If we fast forward to Mark chapter three, we see this unbelievable unfolding of events where Jesus meets a man in the temple and his hand was shriveled up and um, needed to be healed. The Pharisees and Sadducees watching Jesus trying to figure out, are you going to heal on the Sabbath? Which was against the rules. You couldn't do any work on the Sabbath on their Sunday. And Jesus in fact healed this man, which further polarized the crowd. You see, no one ever met Jesus and had an apathetic response, a neutral response. He was either who he said he was, Lord, forgiver of sins, giver of life, redeemer of souls, or he was a liar or he was crazy that he had lost his mind. Later in Matthew cha or Mark chapter three, Jesus' own family, this was in Mark chapter three, verse 20, um, decided that Jesus had become unhinged. A crowd was following him. Jesus was working so hard. He was teaching. And Jesus had many brothers and sisters. We don't know how many. And they came to the home where Jesus was and they tried to seize him. The language in Mark chapter three is literally like arrest him and take him back home because they thought that he had become, you know, something other than, than who he claimed to be. When your own family thinks you're crazy, at least for a period of time, how hard could that be? But it didn't deter Jesus. He continued, in Mark chapter three, verse 22, we see that he was again accused uh, of by the Pharisees and he was accused by the Pharisees of being a liar. And they accused him of being a son of Beelzebub, being the devil himself, being demon possessed. That earlier in the, in the Mark chapter three, that the demons themselves looked at Jesus and said, this guy has to be God, he has to be Lord. And so you see all three of these important questions playing out in just this one chapter of scripture. And it leads us to the point where you, where I, we have to come to a conclusion. Who is Jesus and who is Jesus to me? Because there's no way we can just dismiss Jesus as a moral teacher, as a good guy, as a person we'd like to hang out with and he swap stories around the campfire. He either is the son of God, the person we should give our lives to, the person who died for us and rose again, the very occasion that we celebrate on Easter Sunday, or he's a liar or he's a crazy man. He certainly can't be all three. So who is Jesus to you? Well, it's an uncomfortable question, but one that's worth taking a hard look at, especially on an Easter Sunday morning. I was thinking about uh, this last week when Joy and I went out to dinner with some friends and we were out and uh, the restaurant was crowded, but I don't know, one of my pet peeves is bad service at a restaurant. It seems like you get bad service. It doesn't mean bad waiters or waitresses are bad people. It just means they may not be good at their job. I don't know, but I, I, I appreciate good service. I tip well, I show my appreciation, but I mean, it's nice when somebody's attentive to your needs. And we were out and we were eating and uh, I'm still, you know, following my New Year's resolutions. Most of them, I hope you guys are too. So I'm eating my grilled chicken with no extra oil or butter. It's a little dry. So I finished my entire thing of water that I'm drinking and the rest of us are done with our water. And so we ordered some more water. How hard can water be to bring to a table? And the water didn't come. And so you're, you know, you're kind of dry and you're eating and chewing, trying to get everything down. 
And you're looking around going, okay, it's busy in here. I get it. Maybe the, you know, there's a reason, a logical, you know, explanation and the water doesn't come. And so, you know, I do what you do. You know, I take the water and I put it over on the edge, the very corner of the table. And I just set it down on the corner right there where they can't help but not see it. It's like an international sign for I'm thirsty and need some water. And it didn't make any difference. He kept walking by the table and didn't care, didn't notice. And so then I did the next thing, which is, you know, that next step in escalation where you take it and you drink, but there's nothing there, but there's still ice. And so you shake it a little bit, right? Like that. And then you set it back down on the table and, you know, not trying to be obnoxious or anything, but just trying to make my point. And the guy still doesn't come. And so finally he comes over. It seemed like it was 45 minutes. It probably was only like four or five. And, and this is what he says as he pours the water. He said, I didn't forget you. I just got distracted. And um, I started laughing. And Joy and our friends, they didn't laugh at all. They're like, what are you laughing at? And I said, well, didn't you hear what he said? And they're like, what do you mean? You know, they're drinking their water. And I said, he said, I didn't forget you, but I just got distracted. And I said, isn't that the same thing? And they thought about it for a second and went, well, yeah, I guess it is, right? Because what is distraction, right? I mean, he forgot about us until something reminded him about us and then he wasn't distracted anymore. And so then he remembered and I thought it was odd that he was justifying his forgetting by just calling it a distraction. The reason that I'm bringing us back to this question is, is that some of you probably have become distracted since you've focused on this question, this hard question. Who do you believe that Jesus is? Your forgetting may be blamed on distraction, but now I'm reminding you. And as I remind you, it's a good time for us to come back and make sure that we have an answer to this question because this question is the question that's going to change everything for you in this life and in eternity to come. So let's go back to the women as they left the tomb and finished the story. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. The disciples were having a hard time believing. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb to see for himself. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Peter one of the first ones called by Jesus, who tried to believe right away. Deny yourself and follow me. Leave your life behind and follow me. Peter's like, right on, let's go, Jesus, what you got? He went on a life of following Jesus and learning to trust him. In the middle of a storm, he sees Jesus walking on the water, which seemed hard to believe. But he said, hey, if it's really you, tell me to come, I'll come. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter hops over the side of the boat, starts walking on water in the middle of a storm until all of a sudden he wasn't because he had a little crisis of belief. He began to sink. He threw his hands up and said, help me, Jesus. Jesus did. And Peter settled back into his desire to believe. He'd seen more than most. One of the most notable disciples of Jesus, one of the loudest disciples of Jesus. you think he'd be one of the most faithful. But even Peter didn't have a straight line to faith. When Jesus was arrested, when he was tried, Jesus' words in Matthew 23, when he told the disciples, you're going to see some events that are going to blow you away and make you crumble. Well, they came true. Peter followed the throng, the crowd, the lynch mob, and sort of set up a post outside the gate of the high priest's house. Peter, supposedly a disciple of faith, the one who had swung at somebody's head with a sword just a little bit earlier in the garden to try to protect Jesus and offer up his life, all of a sudden questioned by a junior high girl. You know this guy? Well, the events had turned. He looked a little less likely being the savior than he did, you know, before he was arrested before he was dragged off in handcuffs. And so he said, nope, I don't know him. Denied his faith to a junior high girl, which was the first of three denials that he made, which again fulfilled Jesus' prophecy as Jesus said, Peter, you'll deny me three times and then the rooster will crow. So Peter does it again with a different crowd. And then a third time, 
And then heartbroken slinks away with the rest of the disciples as they disappear in a crisis of faith. So belief is not necessarily a straight line. Peter originally tried to believe. He had some stumbles along the way. When questioned, he took a big step back, had to rethink things. Jesus even appeared to him a couple of times to show him after he rose again that he was for real. And Peter really didn't settle things in his heart until the story at the very end of John. When he saw Jesus, it's a fishing story. And Peter jumped over the side of the boat, swam to shore where Jesus cooked him breakfast. And Peter, secure in his belief, lived the rest of his life as a follower of Christ, and it changed everything. And I want you to know that it can change everything for you too. There's a beginning to our life, and there's an end to our life. And we have responsibilities. One, we have the responsibility with what we do with this from the beginning to the end. And number two, the question we answer about Jesus will send us in one of two directions at the end of our biological life, heaven or hell. And there is no more important decision than the decision you make about Christ and who he is to you. Because he's not just a good teacher. He's not just a person who drops parables from time to time. And you can put things on greeting cards that make people feel better in difficult situations. As I've said, and John Duncan said, and C.S. Lewis said, and countless scholars said, and Mark chapter 3 reinforces, Jesus was either Lord. He was crazy or he was a liar, because no good person would say they're the son of God unless they were the son of God. No sane person would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, unless he was the way to the Father. So we believe that Jesus was who he says he was. I believe that Jesus knew us, and as the Bible says, that as we were formed in our mother's womb, He knew us and had a plan for us. And that after we were born, we were born sinful. Adam and Eve started it in the garden. But you know, I used to be mad at them, especially Eve, because she started it, right? I'm really not anymore. I've been around long enough to know that I probably would have done the same thing. Maybe faster, who knows? I might've been there one day and been like, here, that looks good. I don't know. You might have too. They blew it for everybody. The Bible says that everybody born after Adam and Eve was born sinful for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. His standard for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And that we have a responsibility to choose Christ or to choose ourselves. I know what it's like to choose myself and I don't like it. So I've made my choice, but you have to choose for yourself. I can't choose for you. And so a life in Christ, as Peter found out, and as many of us have found out, isn't just about over there. It's about the peace and the hope and the meaning and the purpose that we get along the way. Where God takes our drive, our gifts, our desires, our abilities, and works them together in a way that's supernatural and purposeful and aligns us with his plan So your life that may seem random or senseless begins to make sense. And some chase success and find success is empty. Some chase love and find love in the wrong place, and they find that it's empty. Because the human heart was not made to be satisfied with anything less than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But we try to fill it with almost everything else along the way. So the decision that we make about Christ fulfills this life as we give ourselves to him. And then when you get to the end of your life, And you breathe your last, which is the thing that most people fear more than anything else, biological death. We don't have to fear because salvation has given us freedom from our past and our sin, freedom in the present moment, and freedom to not worry about the future and our eternity. And we can step into eternity without fear, 
realizing that for the Christian, when we die, we instantly awaken to the reality of heaven. And you hear Jesus say, welcome home. You were good and you were faithful. So do you see why it's so important to not just believe who Jesus is, but to settle who Jesus is for you? The Bible tells us that to make this personal, that we have to confess sin, agree with Jesus, that we've had thoughts, actions, or attitudes displeasing to him. I have, probably today, thank God I'm forgiven. Um, Haven't you? You ever met anybody that says, I've never sinned? I mean, good gracious, how deluded could you possibly be? You ever have a two-year-old? Fortunately, kids, I believe, they have a, a, a little buffer there till they reach an age, you know, somewhere along the way where they're responsible for their actions. But I mean, we're born with a sinful nature. We're all sinful. I don't have a hard time admitting it. And we say, God, I'm sorry. I, I have not lived up to your standard. I have sinned and I need forgiveness. Forgive me for my sin. And the Bible says that when we confess our sin, listen up, this is the good part. When we confess our sin, he's faithful, which means he's going to do it. And he's justified, which means it's right for him to do it, to forgive us of our sin. And here's the best part. And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, many people say, you didn't know how I used to live. And I get to say, it doesn't matter. Because whatever you've done falls under all, and the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cover all sin. How good is that? So we confess our sin. How do I do that? Well, you just tell God. How do I tell God? You think a thought to God because he's installed in you the ability to connect, even though you don't know it. You can say it out loud. You can think it in your head. He's waiting to hear from you. Second thing is you say, listen, I don't know everything there is to know about Jesus, but I know this and I believe it because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, the way to the Father. And here's the third thing, and it's really important. We say, I confess my sin, I believe who Jesus is, but in between the beginning of my life in Christ now and the end of my biological life, I wanna live for you. So everything I have now belongs to you, God. I hold nothing back, I'm yours. I want to live a different way. And then, my friend, you've become a follower of Christ. Then you've answered the question correctly. Who is Jesus to you? You may have come in expecting to order the same thing off the menu, and God may be giving you an amazing surprise. You may have been distracted because some don't like to think about this question. But ignoring the question doesn't make the importance go away. So I've done the best I can to lay it out here at your feet for you to consider a question for you to answer so this could be your best Easter ever. Father, thank you so much for the time that we have spent this morning celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Jesus, God, came to earth in human form, boggles the mind, 100% God and 100% man, living a perfect life and dying a death he didn't deserve, to pay a price I couldn't pay, rising again, defeating sin, Satan, and physical death once and for all. And so on a day like today, Our hearts are filled with gratitude for this free gift of eternal life that you offer and the promise of meaning and purpose between now and then. So I thank you. We tell you we love you. We celebrate you at Easter and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen.